Right. Yes, you've called, you've asked, you've sent me notes, you've put in comments that you actually wanted CERN back. And so we've done it. CERN, welcome back. I understand that, well, I got a phone call yesterday out of the blue. No, actually, I got a phone call from X through X. This phone call didn't even go through the phone company or anybody else. It came to me, I guess, through some satellite or something. I'm not sure exactly how, how all that works. But it, it was you and Scott traveling down to Miami, and you were bashing on each other, and he, and he seemed to be concerned. If you've ever been in a car with Scott for more than an hour, it, it is an interesting experience, let me say. <laughs> but, but yes, we, we enjoyed about seven hours in the car uh, together yesterday down wow. in Miami. Yeah, oh, mackerel. And uh, I understand that you learned some extremely interesting things about robotics and whatnot, but that is a show for another day. That's right. But uh, you you said you needed to set the record st straight with regard to Scott. Yeah. So, you know, Scott seems to um, struggle a little bit with some basic concepts. I, so... I you know, let's let's see if we can help them this time. And maybe instead of, you know, making fun of them, let's try to help them. Oh, okay. Yeah, let's try a different approach because clearly the approach I've been taking hasn't hasn't worked. Yes. Right. But let me let me just bring this up. And okay. I think, you know, this is kind of the key event of this week. The, right? the course. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And this is quite a beautiful image. Um, you can see the the solar flares there and, and all that. And it's it's a you know an amazing thing, amazing thing to experience. Unfortunately, I didn't get to experience it firsthand here in Florida. It wasn't really uh, an event for us, right? Uh, but I you know I should catch one of these one day, if possible. So, you know, as it relates to Scott, you know, I did a little uh, analysis last week of his followers versus mine. Ah. And Scott, on your show, did his own sort of sub-analysis of that. <laughs> and Scott seems to um, have a fundamental un misunderstanding about the relative size of things. Yes. <laughs> right? He's depicting my follower count to be quite a bit smaller than his. And he seems to struggle with basic basic math. I see. And and maybe it's the type of graph that we're using here, the, these circles. Maybe it's, it's a hard thing for Scott to comprehend. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Although being as interested in space as he is, you'd think circles are something he would he would get. Yeah, yeah. But let's let's try some lines instead, Randy, and see oh, if okay. he understands that. Maybe this will be more helpful to him. Okay. And being a space guy, Scott should understand the trajectory of things. Ah. So this is a chart that shows the trajectory of my follower count versus his. This is on X, I'm assuming. On X. Because they're up yes. to the top. Yes. And as exciting as the eclipse was this week, there's going to be another eclipse when <laughs> my follower count exceeds his. I see. I see. Right. So I don't know when that'll happen. It, it'll probably be, you know, in a month or two. <laughs> you know, it's not quite as precise as the the sun, earth, moon eclipse situation. Right. But And now we'll find out exactly how... Um... Uh, competitive Scott is because, you know, he might choose to up his uh, effort or something. You know? Well, he really needs to. I mean, the, the quality of his of his charts leaves something to be desired. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I'm hopeful. I, Scott, <laughs> you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Scott, Scott's capable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so hopefully that helps him, Randy. I, you know, I I'm, don't want to be too hard on the guy. Could, it could. It could help. It yeah. Could. And the final thing is to say is, you know, I get, Scott and I get a lot of comments on these YouTube videos. Yes. And this is one from a recent video that I did with Herbert. Mm -hmm. okay. And, you know, this is a very nice comment. Um, I appreciate when somebody comes to the table with the amount of work that he has done with all the spreadsheets. And he's referring to me. Yes, I think so. The comment on an interview that I did with Herbert. You know, this, this person said it's real value added. And then he added, some of the other people you interviewed talk to at zero value. They just like to hear themselves talk. Now, I don't know whether he's talking about Scott. I think there's a high likelihood that that's the case. But, you know, <laughs> Scott Scott should take this feedback. It's, it's good feedback for him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Enough, enough of that fun. 
if, if there's any viewers left after watching yes, that, yes, yes. let's continue. All right, let's talk about some uh, happenings in the economy. Um, mm -hmm. This is a kind of a funny cartoon. Uh, the Fed's coming in for landing, the plane's falling apart, and they're talking about soft landing. And then uh, somebody, the other co-pilot, I guess, is saying, it must be what the parachute's for. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. All right, big news this week, inflation. So year over year inflation now at 3.5%. Uh, um, how does that stack up with other inflation rates around the world, which I think is always good to put in context. And it's kind of on the high side, frankly. Mm -hmm. Certainly there are some other nations that have inflation much, much higher than we do, but three and a half percent is higher than a lot of places. And it's kind of trending right now in the wrong direction. But so it is, too, in other places around the world. But there's also some places where inflation is low and trending lower. Yeah. So some countries have already cut rates. Uh, the ECB has said that they're independent from the Fed. They'll cut rates if necessary. So it could be an interesting situation where the Fed's on hold for a little longer and the rest of the world starts to cut. So that's something to pay attention to. I noticed New Zealand is not doing that well down there. Yeah, New Zealand's a pretty small country. Um, you know, it's expensive to import lots of things there. It's it's more challenging for them. Yeah, the economy there is. Uh, I didn't I didn't want to give I didn't want to give Scott any ammunition. You know, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> well, being a citizen of the world such that I am, you can call me Canadian. You can but call me right. Kiwi. Yeah. yeah, there's lots of things that Scott could point to to try to make fun of me if he wanted to. Actually, it looks like Canada is not doing that well either. Yeah, and the Canadian Central Bank, I think, is meeting today, and we may get a rate announcement from them. Well, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. All right. So, this is a chart that shows uh, inflation and the core consumer price index uh, since 1990. And you can see we had that inflation spike. It has come down, but it's remained at higher levels, I think, that, that, than the Fed wanted to see. Right. This is true. Right. It's true. And we've talked yeah, about some of the reasons why. Yeah. Before. And by the way, the 3.8 number is also year over year. But for the last 90 days, we've been closer to 5%. Yeah. So that's uh, that's an, an, for both on core and, uh, in fact, what they call super core is even higher. Yeah. And there's all kinds of reasons for that. Even though they try to strip out seasonality, typically inflation rates at the end of the year are lower, even taking out seasonality. So there's some there's some weird things going on. But overall, the, the trend is kind of heading in the right direction. Uh -huh. and we'll see if it, if it can get, get down to where the Fed's comfortable with. Um, this is kind of interesting perspective, and we may have talked about this one time before, but if you took a 2% inflationary trend from January 2020, so pre-pandemic, the inflation index would be at 281, just mm -hmm. the index value. Mm -hmm. But the actual inflation has you know, taken the index up to 312. And so we are about 11% above that 2% trend. Right. Right. And so you know, that's what happens when you just throw a bunch of money at the economy. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, no doubt. <laughs> plus, a, plus a disruption to supply chains and so on. I mean, it wasn't just- Sure, sure, sure. Very stimulus, but yeah. And then uh, we've had 36 consecutive months now of inflation above 3%. Mm. And it kind of puts us in pretty rare territory. Going back to 1948. Yeah. Not like the problem we had in the 1970s, but right. still, a, a, you know, a significant inflationary challenge. Indeed. Okay. Yeah. And then this chart, sorry for all the numbers and all the countries and so on, but just a visual of from March 2022, inflation is pretty high around the world. It is starting to slow down and you get to March last year and then you start to see some green creeping in where inflation is starting to pick up again. Oh, that's what the green means. It's getting worse. Um, I believe so. I believe the red is slowing and the green is, oh. am I reading this wrong? The green is good. I uh, I don't see the 
maybe I'm completely misinterpreting this. I guess the red is inflation above a certain level, maybe above 4%. And then green is maybe less than three, less than two perhaps. And this white is maybe between two and three, two and four. Okay. Sorry, yeah, I, maybe I completely misinterpreted this, but less red, less high inflation, more white and a bit of green smattered in. Right. So globally, I think we're heading in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. The trend, the trend globally is in that direction. So I think you've, I think you've now interpreted it correctly. Yeah, yeah. Don't want to give Scott any further ammunition there. Um, <laughs> need to be careful. Yeah, I'm sure he's watching this very carefully. Yes. So the reality is then uh, we're looking at higher for longer, which means the Federal Reserve is less likely to be aggressively cutting rates. Yes as the inflation bird continues to fly high. Mm. Okay. So just as evidence of that, uh, this is from Charlie Biello, uh, April 3rd. Market expectations then were for rate cut in June, a rate cut in September, and a rate cut in December. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 75 basis points or 0.75% this year. But here's how it stands now. Now we're looking at two rate cuts this year. Right. And the first one doesn't come until September. Mm -hmm. so, and, this be a, and this will be a shocker. If they, they, I think they are so unlikely to have their first rate cut in September, two months before an election. So if they don't do it by July, I think we're looking at December. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll see how economic data come in before then. But it's interesting how the market shifts and yeah. so on. And this has implicate downstream implications that we'll kind of touch on for the rest of this presentation. Um, this is kind of an interesting chart. It shows where the Fed was forecasting rates would be versus the market, the market in blue and the Fed in, in purple or red. Right. Um, so the market kind of got ahead of the Fed. They expected lower rates. And now the market is actually slightly higher than the Fed's official expectations. Yeah. Now, and and, it, and it's so interesting how the market, the bond market especially, was reading the future inflation rate. Given you know they could be looking at a trajectory, they could be looking at in you know they could be doing their own research, but the only organization, the only place that I was really seeing statistical analysis that was being done of the inflation rate much lower and continuing today, trueflation is continuing to show the numbers under two percent. Um, and in next Tuesday, there will be a spaces at 6.30 a.m. California time where Trueflation and I are going to duke it out. Now, they've invited me to come on as their guest, and we are going to talk about what in the heck, how can Trueflation be at 1.74 this morning when the CPI and PPI just came out and they're up at 4%. So people might, may want to join that spaces next Tuesday. That is a must-watch episode for sure. Hopefully, you can set uh, Trueflation straight. I hope so, or they can set me straight. I'm sure one of those two may be anyway. in the middle. <laughs> right. Yep. So implications of all this are the interest rates, whether it's a 30-year fixed mortgage rate, um, have gone high and stayed high. Now, high is a relative term. High yep. relative to recent history. Right. Um, high relative to many people who are buying houses today in their experience, but 6.8% uh, 30-year uh, mortgage rates um, are a little bit higher than where we saw them just a few years ago. Right. But if you go back to September 06, that was the last time they were around that number. Yeah. So it's not that long ago. <laughs> well, 20, 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. 20 years is a long time, and it's also a very short period, depending on your perspective. Right. But we're no, nowhere near the rates that we had in the 70s and 80s. Right. Um, so thank goodness for that. And then this is the uh, interest rate on credit cards, a mere 21, 22%. <laughs> so, so, yeah, that, that is no doubt hurting uh, many folks. Oh, yeah. And then this is the interest expense on the U.S. debt outstanding. We've now crossed over $1 trillion of interest expense for the last 12 months. Right. So the government is feeling this pain too. And of course, how do they get that money? Well, it's got to be through taxes or just printing it. Yes. 
Yeah. So anyway, um, that's not a good trend. And then it's also hurt uh, new car loans. Uh, interest rate on that is now about five and a half, eight and a half percent. So that is certainly one uh, explanation for why the automobile sector has continued to struggle. Uh, 80% of people who buy cars finance it. Yeah, and, and I can't say this often enough. Um, eventually, if if these uh, rates stay much this high for long or even go a little higher, um, this will become normalized. And people's yeah. people's attitudes will switch and they'll begin to say, well, I'm not, you know, I can't wait for a car any longer. I can't wait for that house any longer. And in fact, you also are starting to get another trend. I just seen, I've just seen one headline on this, but it's another trend, which is obvious, which is if the rates look like they're going up, people are now, even though they're high, some people are going to say, hey, I need to get in before they go even higher. Mm -hmm. I think there's also been an education process over the last 20 years where consumers, whether it's car loans or whether it's house loans, have house loans, have realized I can refinance it later. Um, so I get I get in at eight percent, seven percent, eight percent on a house loan. But if the rates do come down, then I can come in later and grab something at a lower interest rate. That's right. And also the ultimate mechanism is price. So if the price of a vehicle comes down or the price of a home comes down, right. even though the rate's higher, that payment may not be that that different. Right. Yep. And then um, today, producer price index, um, 2.1%, basically. It's the highest since a year ago. So we've had a little bit of a resurgence in inflation there, too. So, you know, a, little, a few bumps in the road. Uh, the trend of declining inflation, you know, has kind of taken a little pause. Um, but hopefully we can get back on that trend again. No. Yeah, there's there's also a question about the PPI versus the CPI. I've talked about it a lot on this channel, and there's been a tremendous number of studies done worldwide to try to determine whether a CPI is predict. I mean, whether the PPI predicts the CPI, it's not a very good predictor. Right. There are too many other factors that go into the yep. final consumer price besides the items that are in the PPI. So right. uh, it's not a great predictor, but it's a general. And that's why the Fed doesn't use it. It's its third. It's at least third in in line in terms of their interest. They like the C, uh, PCE. They like the CPI. Then they look at the PPI. Yep. No, that's a really good point. Um, and then just even even further down down chain is the commodities uh, price changes over the last year. We have talked about the price of uh, chocolate essentially going up. You know, two hundred and forty percent. Orange juice is up 75, uranium is up 72%, pork belly is up 60, olive oil is up 58%, etc. Yeah. Um, and you don't even have gold in here, which is up 25% in the last 90 days. Uh gold bullion over the last year is showing up 13% here. Yeah. Yeah. So that's oh, in there. Okay. Oh, I see it. Okay. Yeah, we've got quite a few different things in here. Um now, interestingly, over here, we've got eggs down 21%. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just hold that thought for a second. But I would say that the New Zealanders are doing their part. The price of wool has come down. There you go. So uh, don't, don't uh, you know, fault New Zealand too much. <laughs> for high inflation, they're doing their part. Is this a regularly available chart? That's a good question. I don't know. That remains to be seen. I'll have to, I'll have to check. It's a nice, it's a nice summary. Yeah, it's great. I love it. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't a date on here. I'm assuming it's recent or it might be the end of March. Okay. I don't know that it's as of, you know, yesterday or anything like that, but it's right, right. fairly recent numbers. Okay. Now, back to the eggs. Um, interestingly, now, you know, we're concerned, I guess, again, about avian flu again. Yeah. And this is a chart from um, Jeffrey Kleintop at Schwab. And he's showing that the egg price volatility goes crazy during avian flu outbreaks. Yeah, I guess so. Right. If you have to call the herd because of that, then egg prices can go through the roof. But so far, egg prices, I guess, have, have been OK. They're down 21 percent from a year ago. Um, right. I guess they've done a, maybe a, a full you know, drop and then recovery here, but um, still down from a year ago. Yeah, but still extremely high compared to uh, 
historical levels. Yeah, and this is price six months annualized volatility. So this actually isn't the price of eggs. It's just how volatile the egg price is. Oh, I got it. I got it. Yeah, I yeah. see. I see. Okay. Yeah. So the one commodity that, that some people might be happy about, particularly if they've owned it, is uh, oil. <laughs> and this is a kind of a cute chart. This guy, I guess, has been trading oil and he's pretty happy about it. His colleagues, I guess, aren't so happy. But uh, we talked about this before. This is uh, West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil Futures. They've spiked up recently. Again, not not anything crazy. It's This is the way oil markets work. But certainly something to keep an eye on as far as inflation. Oh, absolutely. Another cute cartoon. I'm not sure if I'm bullish, but I'm easily stampeded. <laughs> And growing up in Calgary, Alberta, I am very familiar with the Calgary Stampede. Sure. So um, if anybody has not experienced that, I'd highly recommend to travel to Calgary, I believe in July of each year, and check out the Stampede. Huh. Um, anyway, so let's move on then to uh, jobs. Uh, last Friday, we learned that the U.S. unemployment rate is 3.8% mm -hmm. off of the low of 34 uh, but well down from the most recent high of almost 15%, 14.7%. So the economy is humming along pretty nicely from a jobs perspective, or at least it appears to be so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Now, it's interesting to see where those jobs are. Um, healthcare and social assistance jobs in March had the biggest increase. Yep. 81,000 jobs. And the next biggest category was government. So it's kind of interesting that the, you know the government is on hold because of strong job state and strong inflation. Well, if they'd stop hiring people, <laughs> maybe we wouldn't have this problem. Um, but you know, it's an election year, so you need to give everybody a job that wants one. Yeah, yeah, and so yeah, and and so these are also not sustainable. So you you know the government cannot continue to hire because they are constrained by budgets. Uh, wow. Well. Leisure, you would leisure. like them to be constrained by budgets. Yeah, yeah. Leisure and hospitality, you know, we've had this bounce, uh, which is which is not likely to continue to get bigger and bigger, at least not forever. Uh, construction uh, is largely a, a factor of this uh, this uh, big Im impact of government spending uh, in, on infrastructure and the CHIPS Act and whatnot. That mm -hmm. is not going to be increasing again uh, this fall. So there's a, a bunch of this that is not sustainable. It's going to have to start coming from manufacturing or wholesale or something, something other than government, medical care and hospitality, um, because they're, 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 I think they're going to be tapped out. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, it'll be interesting to watch for sure. Um, and then if you are looking for a job, um, come to Florida, it looks like four <laughs> of the top 10 cities, in the United States for the hottest job markets are in Florida. <laughs> uh, also pretty good in Salt Lake City, Utah, Oklahoma City, Austin, Texas, Nashville, Tennessee, Seattle, Washington, and Dallas, Texas. Yeah. So shout out to these drivers of our economy. Yeah, I would say uh, almost all of those look like free states except for Seattle. Yeah, well, it might be something to do with uh, Microsoft and OpenAI and Amazon. Maybe, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, a few big employers like that driving things. It's definitely not Boeing. Definitely not Boeing. So I don't know if there's anything else to point here. There's uh, different categories, overall rank, unemployment rate rank, labor force participation, change in payrolls, change in labor force size, and change in average weekly wages rank so uh tampa ranks number one there miami number two on the mm -hmm. wage side yeah um labor force participation everybody that wants a job in austin texas yeah has a job in austin texas that's great so yeah there's, there's definitely some strong uh strong parts of the country yep 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 in terms of job markets all right um this is also looking at sort of you know, pre-COVID and the impact of that, uh, we may have shared this before as well, but if 
the pre-COVID trend had continued and we added about 1.5% you know, new jobs a year, we'd, we'd be, at about, be at about 162 million people in the workforce today, but the mm -hmm. actual workforce right now is about 158 million. Mm -hmm. So the question is why, Randy, why do you think this is the case? Why are we missing 4 million jobs? Well, so the 2% increase per year is not necessarily always going to be a straight line. But if we go on the other side, who hasn't come back? And basically, who hasn't come back um, has been some seniors that might have otherwise been in the, in the workforce. I read, I'm not sure this is still true, but up until a few months ago, I was still seeing a lot of uh, headlines talking about that not all the moms had come back. Mm. Um, so these are, you know, a couple of categories where you might call them marginal workers. Uh, they might need to work or they might, they might like to work, um, or they might feel like they don't want to work if, if they can possibly afford not to. Um, but I have not, other than that, I have not seen any, I mean, clearly the biggest category that has not uh, come back is, is housing. Um, and that is 10% of the economy. So, um, but it wasn't very good before COVID either. Yeah. Well, I can confirm the uh, reasoning you gave in terms of people retiring. Okay. So we had what's called excess retirements um, during COVID. People decided to say, okay, this is a great time for me to retire. Uh -huh. So apparently we've had, uh, I don't know, the total number of excess retirements. I think it's something like 2.7 million. Wow. So that 4 million difference, 2.7, 2.5, maybe 3 million of it is could be accounted for by excess retirements. Right. People that wouldn't have been expected to retire, but did. Right. Okay. So so kudos to you on that. Uh, I don't know about, about you know, working mothers, you know, not coming back to work. That, mm -hmm. that could be a factor. That wouldn't surprise me. Another thing that's interesting related to this is all the growth in U.S. employment has come from immigrants. Yeah. So, you know, depending on what side you fall on this whole immigration debate, the fact remains that employment growth has come from immigrants. Um, I guess you could argue that, you know, they've taken jobs away from U.S. citizens. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's the work that U.S. citizens didn't want to do. At this point, I think if anybody is, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, Rock Rib Republican, everybody knows that, total conservative. But clearly, there's a couple of things about immigration. Number one, you have to, if you want a growing economy, you're probably going to have to grow your population. The United States population is not growing. We have, we are under replacement rate at this point in terms of natural births. So you're going to have to get that growth from someplace. Mm -hmm. The rest of the world is seeing net negative population growth, uh, except for Canada. Canada is an exception to that. They're also growing by immigration. Mm -hmm. um, but if you, in the United States, what we have right now is we have two kinds, of course, every country has this. You have legal and you have illegal. The legal immigration is at terrible lows and should be, I think every, even conservatives would, every conservative I know would say we need more legal immigration, whether that's college graduates and doctors and lawyers and things of that nature, or whether that is folks to, you know, mow the lawn. We need more workers at both ends of the spectrum and probably in between as well. So I think the, the real question is, how do, we, how do we want immigration to work? Not whether we need it, just how do we want it to work? Agreed. Yeah, I'm completely on board with you there. Uh, it doesn't seem fair to let anybody walk into the country if they want to at a border and then other people to go through the, what the official process is and have them wait years and years and years. Um, that just doesn't seem like the right thing to do, in my opinion. Well, and then anyway. there's the, and there's the flip side of that. The people that are waiting years and years have been vetted. We know who they are. We yeah. know we know that they're they're the they're people we would like to come and 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 join us. Where people that are just walking across the border, we have no idea who they are. That's right. Yeah. Anyway, I thought this was an interesting stat showing that, yep. that immigration has accounted for all the U.S. employment growth yes. since the pandemic, pretty much. Okay. Just back to the payroll numbers again. We've talked about this before, but just, you know, every time you hear these payroll numbers, just understand that there's significant um, 
challenges and problems with these numbers. One is expectations. So Wall Street economists come up with the expectations. And since the pandemic, or really the last few years, the payroll numbers has come in higher than what the expected number has been uh. for some reason. And it just may be that it's been harder for these economists and whoever's putting these numbers together to figure out what it should be. Yeah. So it's been pretty consistently higher. The, the bottom chart shows that there's only four months where they got it wrong and it was lower than what they expected. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it's been quite a bit higher. So that tells me that there's a bit of a problem with their methodology or, or the way they used to do it has changed. Something about the report has changed. Yeah. And we've discussed this before in that the, the, the number of people responding to the survey and the, the initial release is pretty low. It's, it's in the 50s or 60s percent. And it doesn't, it takes a, another month or two to get the full numbers. Right. But that right. may be a part of it. The other thing that we've talked about before is the revisions. Right. Um, so it's important not to get overly exercised about any one month's payroll number because it's going to be revised either up or down. Um, and you can see since the pandemic, the revisions have been huge relative to what they were historically on the, on the bottom chart. Right. Okay, so just a word of caution there about payroll and, and seeing the announced numbers. It's really a month or two after the fact that you need to look at the data and really see where, where it is. And start smoothing it out. Yeah. And those major downward revisions was considered to be recessionary. We had, I think, 11 out of 12 months or something where we had downward revisions. Mm -hmm. But this last month, we finally had a time where they were revised slightly upward. Yeah. Um, so, but well, one month is not a data, does not a trend make, but we'll see what happens to the data going forward. That's right. Yep. So, you know, we're making decisions as best we can on all this data, but the data itself is a bit, a bit flawed at times. Yep. Okay. So let's move to markets. Um, this shows the S and P 500's return, the TR column, total return versus the DD column, which is the drawdown. And drawdown simply means at any given point in the year, what's the maximum decline from any level down to the maximum lowest level? So the market could go up, and then if it dropped 10%, yes. right, and then recovered and had a good year, it's that drop that's the drawdown that you're measuring, the biggest drop during the year. Mm -hmm. So, so far this year, the drawdown has only been 1.7% through the end of end of March. Okay. And the S&P was up 10.6% as of that date. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting to look at typically in years where the drawdown is pretty low, like 1995, the one highlighted in blue there, the drawdown that year was 2.5% and the S&P was up 37.6%. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and if you look at 2017, the S&P was down, the drawdown was two, down 2.8% 2 and the S&P was up 21.8%. Yeah. No. So typically years where the drawdown is large, like the red numbers, is also a typical typically when you get really poor returns in the S&P. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Makes so sense. 1931 and 1937 and, and 2008, et cetera. So past performance doesn't guarantee future results, but right. this is kind of interesting to look at. So far, where you have a year where it's pretty low volatility in the markets, despite all the uncertainty about what the Fed's going to do. Mm-hmm. And despite lingering concerns about inflation and higher interest rates, the stock market is, has taken it pretty well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then in addition to that, um, looking forward, if you look at analyst expectations for profit margins, how profitable companies are, and this chart excludes financials and energy, which tend to be all over the place. Right. And those are pretty important sectors of the economy. But this this looking at the rest, which mm -hmm. tend to be more stable, profit margins are expected to, to bottom this quarter and expected to increase for the remainder of the year or nice. third and fourth quarter about the same. Hmm. So things are looking up as far as analyst expectations for corporate profitability. So in the next couple of weeks, next three weeks, as these earnings reports are coming in in big numbers, we should be looking both at whether or not, because right now the, the most recent uh, conversations I've heard around earnings coming out in the next few weeks are, 
pretty good expectations, but maybe they would still be lower than the fourth quarter, according to this chart. But also, what are the what 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 do the earnings calls sound like? What are what are these guys projecting out for the rest of the year? Would they be as bullish as this chart suggests? That's right. And, and a lot of people often are confused. They say, well, the company just announced great earnings, but yet the stock is down after hours. What's yeah. going on? And often it's because now the analysts are listening to what management says on the call and they're inferring changes for the future quarters. Right. Right. And so they're reading, reading the tea leaves. Some, some managements are very direct about that and others aren't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the analysts do their best job to try to figure that out. Okay. This was interesting too, just in terms of, uh, changing sector weights, I guess, over time uh, from 1975 through to uh, the present in the March. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the names of the list, words on the right there are the different S&P sectors. Um, real estate certainly is a big part of our economy, but it was never its own sector in the S&P until fairly recently. Uh -huh. and it's still pretty small. Financials have always been part of the S&P and Financials kind of peaked right before the great financial crisis, right at 22%. And today, financials are 13% of the S&P 500. The tech bubble in 2000, the tech index was 33%. Mm. And that's now 30. Now, this is actually understating how big tech is because there are a lot of companies now that are tech, that were considered tech back then, that are now part of communication services like Facebook. Right, right. Right. And, and so on. So tech is actually, by the old definition, is actually bigger than what it's showing here. Um, healthcare has been pretty steady. Consumer staples, pretty steady. Consumer discretionary, pretty steady. Industrial is pretty steady. Communication stocks, pretty steady, thanks to the, to the changes. Um, utilities, 2%. Materials, 2%. Energy, 4 Energy has, has had peaks and valleys, uh, with the biggest one being back in the early 80s. Wow. That's interesting. Energy. So actually, though, if you look at, not unsurprisingly, if you really look at the whole chart, though, industrials have been steadily declining. Yeah. Materials has been steadily declining. And energy has been steadily declining. So those three sectors have clear trends of getting much, much smarter as a percentage of the of the overall S&P. That's right. With, with tech and healthcare. Uh, Being the ones that healthcare. are getting here. Yeah. 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 So that's, you know, it's just an interesting, interesting yeah. perspective to have, but there are some things they've done to monkey with this over time and reclassify companies. And that makes it maybe less, less comparable over time. Um, but. So here's a kind of a cute cartoon. Some markets are bearish. Sometimes they're bullish, but mostly they're cattish. They ignore us. They don't <laughs> listen. They're impulsive. They have their own agendas and do whatever the hell they want. <laughs> as the cat knocks off the the plant on the on the night. Yes, stand. yes, yes. Okay, so maybe we should stop being bearish or bullish. Uh, catish is <laughs> the normal. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. So this relates to this chart. I I use that to set this up right uh -huh, now. Uh -huh. Yeah. I, I feel like I need to tell Scott that. <laughs> tell Scott. Yeah. That's right. yeah. So in the short term, what drives stock prices? Well, it's it's the multiple changes. It's the PE ratio changes. It's not so much the revenue growth or the earnings or free cash flow or the margin, the profitability of the business. It's more about how people feel about the prospects for a company. That tends to drive short-term prices. Right. Inflation numbers come out. People decide they sell stocks because they're worried about higher inflation, et cetera. That's independent of what any company is doing. But over time, what matters more is the actual sales and profit growth of a company. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the key with this chart is it's showing sources of total shareholder return for top quartile performers. So the top 25% of the names. Mm -hmm. That's what's driving them. This is not the enti entire market. It's probably not that different, I think, for the entire market, but it might be a little bit different. Hmm. But certainly for the companies that are doing well, what matters most is their profitability and the growth hmm. of the business, hmm. which makes sense, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm kind of surprised that free cash flow doesn't get a, a bigger chunk of that, but uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Um. All right. So let me ask you this question. If I was to give you a choice in the year 2005, and I say, Randy, would you like to own Google stock? Or would you like to own Domino's Pizza? Which one would you pick? <laughs> well, this sounds like a trick question to me, but if I if I if I wasn't looking for trickery, I guess I'd say Google. Well, and that would be a bad choice. <laughs> you should always go for the pizza. They they I IPO always go the same year. <laughs> Domino's Pizza is up eight thousand and two hundred percent. And Google is only up 6,000%. Yeah, only. <laughs> so you wouldn't be too unhappy with your choice, but no, no. The, the Domino's guy, he, he's going to have a fancier car in his driveway than, than you. It's true. Look at that. Who knew? Yeah. Isn't that amazing? It is. Um, yeah. I, I was actually surprised when I saw this, but Domino's has done extremely well. So who, who says, again, the restaurant business is a bad business? Yeah, that's right. That's show right. Them, show them this chart. Yep. Now, this is an interesting chart uh, comparing Apple to the S&P. Uh, for the last little while, it was kind of in lockstep with the markets, but it has diverged really from the S&P yes, yes, beginning yes. of the year. Yes. Um, and over the one year, the S&P is up 27 and Apple's only up two. So... Some people feel that Apple has missed the AI opportunity. Some people, people feel that the Apple Vision Pro has been a, a dud. But I am here to say, and this is not financial advice, but don't count out <laughs> Apple yet. <laughs> yes. They're not done yet. Um, and this is kind of interesting. Um, Alphabet has $100 billion of net cash on their balance sheet. So it's their cash minus their debt. And Apple has about 65 billion of cash. So Apple, Alphabet, Meta, Amazon, Microsoft, NVIDIA have pretty strong balance sheets yes. in terms of their cash positions. Yeah. Um, so anyway, Apple and Alphabet, a lot of a lot of dry powder. Yeah, it looks to me like uh, you could have included Tesla in there. It would have been it would have been a happy, uh, a happy uh maybe between Microsoft and NVIDIA there. Well, this is the Wall Street Journal, so they're not going to include Tesla in this. That's list. right. That's of course not. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I can only work with the charts that are yes, provided yes. to me. Yeah. All right. You ready to play our, our usual weekly game of guess who this is? Uh, go ahead. I think your track record so far, Randy, has been zero for two. Oh, is that it? <laughs> yeah. Not, not that I'm keeping score or anything. Yeah, no, or that the questioner might be part of the problem. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, definitely. So, yes. All right. Who is this company? Profits have remained elusive. Okay. They have never made any money. Sorry. They, 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 they made, made a little bit of money in 2015 in the fourth for, quarter. For a second, huh? Sorry, 2021 in the fourth quarter. They made a little smidge of profit. Uh, there, you know, there's a uh, there was a name that came up the other day, and I'm trying to remember who it was. I don't think it was Airbnb, but it seemed like it was somebody like them, where you're, where you would think that based on their, their oh Uber maybe. It's not Uber. Okay, think of a social network that maybe your grandkids might use. TikTok. Close. How about well, Snapchat? Snapchat. Oh, Snapchat. They've lost $11 billion in less than a decade. Wow. So yeah. And that's a successful business right there that they've been able to do this over a decade. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> right? That's crazy. Yeah. Is, has, so, Uber, has Uber made money? You know, I don't know offhand. I can do some research on that and report back to you next Thursday. Yeah, yeah. I think I think Uber's turned the corner, but I, I don't know where they stand in terms of cumulative profits. Right, right. Um, but I'll get my research department on that. 
Okay, cool. All right. Um, office vacancies now near 20%. 20%? Wow. So it's been hard, hard times in the commercial real estate. The pandemic did not help. And since then, things have not gotten much better. Yeah. Right. But I'm here with some good news. Mm. That if you are a luxury brand, just buy the building that you're in. Because if you don't, your competitor will. So this has been one bright spot. Ah. The luxury brands are racing to buy properties in the world's most famous shopping streets. Ah. Reason here that if they don't buy their flagship store from the landlord, one of their rivals will do so and send them packing. I see. Okay, so there's a couple of examples here. Um, in Milan, they handed Blackstone $1.4 billion, the owner of Gucci and... Uh, so yeah. Well. yeah, so oh. that's what you have to do for survival these days is, is buy, buy out... The, the buy the building. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a bright spot there for you in commercial real estate. <laughs> yeah, I, I've... Uh, uh... I have an interesting history. Maybe I'll tell you about someday with regard to uh, commercial real estate. But uh, probably the biggest, second biggest real estate mistake I ever bought did was not buying my building uh, in when I had when I was in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, all right. I don't have a transition for this one, but looking ahead to the number of uh, storms for this year. Oh, yeah. The number of main storms is forecasted to be 23, up from an average of 14. We're expecting to have 115 storm days, up from 69. 11 hurricanes, 45 hurricane days, five major hurricanes. And I could go on. Yeah. So this is to the people of Florida and the Gulf Coast. Could be a fun year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've uh, I've been watching this very carefully for many, many, many years. Their forecasts are not really good. Yeah. <laughs> minor minor detail, Randy. Okay. This, minor, this is all about scaring people here. I see. Okay, okay. We'll, we'll give them the facts later. Yeah. Yeah. No, we're, we're stooping to what mainstream media does. Yeah. So we should. So thank you for that. I, yeah. All right. I guess I'm struggling for material at this point, right? We get to a certain point in the show <laughs> where what else do I show? Well, let's bring it back to Tesla. Because okay. I know I have an interest in that. Um, the world perhaps hit peak gas-powered vehicle sales in 2017, and maybe didn't know it. Okay. But over time, we now have uh, hybrids taking share and plug-in hybrids and electrics. Mm -hmm. And this is a little bit of a forecast as well, going out to 2026. Yeah. Um, Ark Invest wrote about this and they shared this chart that showed the growth of global vehicle sales. Um, certainly battery electric vehicles have had high growth rates. That growth rates come down in the last couple of years because of more challenging economic conditions, higher interest rates, et cetera. Right. Right. But still growing faster than internal combustion engine vehicles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that, that S curve of adoption and growth is maintained even though the growth rate has come down. Right. Okay, so that's that's some good news in a tough uh, period. Yeah. Now, for the bad news, and this relates to inflation, is auto insurance rates up 22% year over year. Mm -hmm. And in my state of Florida, we now have an estimated 25% uh, of people are uninsured motorists. Yeah. So this may be one reason why is insurance rates have gotten prohibitively expensive. Right. Well, so, so these these are year-over-year uh, -year changes. Mm -hmm. So in other words, oh, I see. This is uh, by month, though. I get it. Okay. Yep. All it's right. Rolling sort of 12-month change. So, so a 4% year-over-year change would be normal. But since 2022, we've seen these large yeah. increases. Right. And this, this chart here might give you a bit more of a historical time period. It goes back to 1995. Okay. You can see, you know... Five to ten percent, I guess, could be more normal. Fluctuates in that range. Mm -hmm. Pandemic, we had a drop, and then we had a spike, and then since then it's continued to go up. Yeah. Right. So, we, so we've talked about this on my channel before, but for those of, who have missed it, this is a very easily understood and explained situation where 
during after the pandemic, when we had this supply shortage problems, it, 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 one of the biggest places it was impacted was new cars, car parts, car replacement parts, um, et cetera. And so as a result, when insur when the insurance companies go back to the insurance aid, the insurance commissions in each state at the end of the year and go, okay, look, we paid all this money for, all, we had to pay this much uh, out of our income for uh, insured claims, we need a raise. Well, they were able to show that they were losing money hand over fist. And in fact, California and Florida had some companies pulling out because their losses were so great. State Farm, I think, is not writing new policies in either state. So you, you've got that situation happening because of the, still because of this supply chain issue. However, right now, the insurance companies are making money hand over fist. They are, their free cash flow is amazing. So when they go to the insurance commissions later this year and say, okay, uh, we need to set our rates, the insurance commissions are going to go, yeah, you have to lower your rates because you can't, they don't, won't allow them to make those kind of returns. I hope you're right. That remains to be seen, but um, hopefully that's the case. Certainly, um, you know, at the bottom here, it says that uh, Allstate and Progressive, you know, their stocks are up, you know, 21 and 29%. So investors are excited about the profitability. Yes. Uh, to your point, that may be temporary. Um, one of the things, though, objectively, is that Americans are atrocious drivers. <laughs> the driving record is atrocious. Um, and this is pretty staggering. So if you look at this chart on this next page, the United States there is at the top of this list, and the, being at the top is not a good thing. Right. And our uh, motor vehicle crash deaths per 100,000 population has not changed since 2015. Hmm. This data is as of 2015 and 2019. And if you look at every other nation, pretty much almost without exception, there's been some improvement. Hmm. Now, I'm sorry to point out New Zealand didn't improve, so there's more fodder for Scott, but almost every other nation saw a pretty nice improvement or some improvement yeah. from 2015 to 2019. And we are out there on our own as an outlier on this chart. Um, this is not a good thing. Not a good thing. <laughs> so this is a nice segue to this whole idea of a robo-taxi network. Let's get humans out from behind the wheel. Let's make a roadway safer, right? And before we go there, I just want to correct an error I made actually in a video with you last week. Okay. Okay, so the question was, how much could Tesla make potentially if they license FSD to other automakers to make their cars safer, <laughs> right? And I developed the model and I went through this with you and I shared this chart <laughs> that, Tesla could make, you know, over time, you know, 35 billion a year mm -hmm. uh, in licensing revenue, which would almost always, not always, but almost all would be profit. Right. But in this chart, in my haste to make this chart, I forgot to include the cumulative nature of this revenue. So when they add more vehicles one year, that becomes recurring oh. revenue for the next, and then you have more revenue. Yes. So here's the corrected chart. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> now the chart shape looks similar, but the numbers on the left change dramatically. Dramatically. <laughs> okay, so just I'll go back. Yeah. 35, 40 billion in 2040. Now the yeah. numbers on the left are 180 billion-ish. Yeah. That's a difference. Yeah. Um, now this assumes that there's no robo taxi network. This is just assumes that FSD is being paid for, people are subscribing to it. Right. A couple hundred bucks a month. Tesla's right. getting a share. Now, we do expect that there will be a change in the business model that cars will drive themselves. So we won't right. need people to drive supervised FSD. So, but that said, that the FSD revenue could still continue even in that world if the other vehicles from other automakers are included in a robo taxi network. Mm -hmm. Right. If they're running Tesla's FSD, then a Ford vehicle, for right. example, could be part of Tesla's robo taxi network. Right. So, in that case, these numbers would still be good. But I'm going to tease this up for perhaps our next show. I've been doing some thinking about the implications of a robotaxi network. First order, second order, and third order 
effects. Right. On the on society, so, on the way we th do things, on yeah. how we live our lives. Yeah. So I'll leave that hanging thread there. And folks will need to come back to the next show to learn more about this. <laughs> okay. That'll be great. Uh, so CERN, uh, any parting shots? I mean, any parting thoughts uh, that may or may not have anything to do with Scott Walter? No, you know, Scott Walter's a great guy. Um, occasionally I learn a few things from him. Yeah, me too. Uh, he does seem to be challenged by his um, ability to operate Zoom and bring up charts and interpret charts. But but I'm I'm here to help him with that. Right. And as, as his friend, I'll, I'll help him as long as necessary to, to make sure he understands what a, a line chart means. So I, I, what I want to do is I want to send you all the data from my YouTube channel since the inception, all the data for the last 15 months. Yep. And there'll be this one piece of data that you probably won't like, which has got Scott with the biggest ever, I think, 54,000 or 56,000 views. Um, you know, and then a few other people down below that. And, um, you know, and I don't remember, I don't think Scott had any, um, any charts or graphs on that particular show. Um, and so that would be one of those ones where, you know, Scott might be able to, you know, give himself some thumbs up. I certainly gave him thumbs up for it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, kudos to Scott. Um, he's entertained lots of bots, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Scott, Scott is great. There's, there's a lot that can be learned from Scott. Um, but I just, I need to set him straight every now and then, Randy. That's not, true. not That's true. Yeah, I agree. It's a, very good. Yes. And by the way, I think you, you'll probably have something to say about all of this. I'm not sure. Well, I, I hope, I hope so. I mean, I hope that he, he now understands, you know, what a line chart means and what it's showing. Um, and the oncoming eclipse, the eclipse that is, that is about to come. He's, he missed the eclipse this week. Yes. Uh, but he won't mix, miss the next one. All right, CERN. Thank you again, as always, for bringing us a, a, a plethora of uh, super interesting data that uh, people can use or not use. But hopefully it's something that helps all of us get a kind of a better picture of where the economy is going, where Tesla is going, where the stock market is going, et cetera, and maybe our investments our investment decisions will be wiser. And uh, and then the final chart you need to do next week would be what really makes people successful as individual investors? Is it truly just luck? <laughs> no, it is not. But we can talk about that next week. Okay. All right. There you go. Yeah. They're great. Okay. Thanks again, sir. And to all of you out there, it's been great talking to you. Thanks, Randy.